Joining me today is our friend and colleague, Dr. Ruven Firestone, the Re uh, Regenstein Professor in Medieval Judaism and Islam at the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religions, Kerbal Campus in Los Angeles. Dr. Firestone is one of the preeminent scholars in the field of Judaism-Islam dialogue. Dr. Firestone has written over 100 scholarly chapters and articles and eight books with translations into German, French, Hebrew, Turkish, Arabic, Albanian, and many other languages. Today, Dr. Firestone will discuss Muhammad's treaty guaranteeing equal rights for Jews under Islamic rule. Please welcome Dr. Firestone. Thank you, Dr. Biton. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and really an honor to be able to give a talk for the Cloud Library, which is, pro is no doubt the most um, extensive Jewish library outside of the National Library in Jerusalem. It is an incredible holding of books and manuscripts and other documents uh, that treat uh, Jewish life and related uh, communities all around the world, really from the earliest period until today. So it's really a, a great uh, honor to be here and to be a part of this project. So we're gonna be looking at some Judeo-Arabic documents that um, treat a very interesting uh, phenomenon in Jewish life and in, I guess you could say in Islamic life as well. These document that Muhammad made a special covenant with the Jews that were living in Haibar, which is near Mecca in, uh, in Arabia, after the Jews had saved him, the prophet of Islam from near destruction at the hands of Arab idolaters. So about a dozen copies of this manuscript have been found so far. The earliest is from the Cairo Geniza. Um, we have some documents in the Cloud Library from the Cairo Geniza. The Geniza is a statement, it's a, it's, a, it's a name that's used to describe holding places in Jewish uh, synagogues where sacred texts were placed before they would be buried in a cemetery. And the uh, Genizas in Cairo, there was more than one, the Genizas in Cairo uh, were not emptied for about a thousand years. And they retained documents that go back all the way into the ninth century. Uh, and they were preserved because of the very dry, warm climate there. And they preserved incredible uh, material. This earliest uh, copy of this treaty or of this covenant is, uh, is found in the Cairo Geniza and it's dated from something like the 10th century. Um, but most of them that we have are from Yemenite Tichlals. A Tichlal is a personal Sidur or prayer book. The, in, the, in Yemen, the printing press didn't come until really the 20th century. So for people to write down prayers, they wrote by hand. And in the backs of these Tikhlal prayer books were often placed other documents that were very important, sometimes marriage contracts, wedding contracts, um, deeds to homes or land purchases. And they were also written in and signed in these books. So the books were preserved when the Yemenite Jewish community left Yemen and came to Israel. And um, now these are coming to light and we're finding all kinds of interesting copies of this particular document. All right, so uh, here we go. We're gonna take a look. Let's see uh, the backstory of what this is all about. Jews and Christians, you know, lived under the rule of Islam and they were protected communities. The Arab conquest or the Muslim conquests began in the seventh century and they managed to take control of much of the known world. They averaged about a hundred square miles per day for uh, a century of conquest. And most of the Christian Byzantine empire came under the rule of Islam as well as many other lands beyond the Byzantine empire was very successful. The new Muslim regime would not tolerate idolatry. This is a 19th century Kashmiri painting of the conquest of Mecca and the destruction of its idols. You can see it in the left column. I don't know, can you see my cursor? I don't actually know if you can see the cursor. Yeah, 
So these are this sort of a depiction of the idols that were destroyed in Mecca. Uh, so Mecca had to be conquered by Muhammad because the people that controlled Mecca during the life of the prophet were idolatrous Arabs who opposed him. So he conquered Mecca and he destroyed the idols there. But Christianity was another matter because Christians were monotheists. This is a depiction of the Battle of Yarmouk in 636 by a 14th century anonymous uh, artist from Catalan. Uh, could have been a Muslim, could have been a Christian. The result of this conquest was an overwhelming Muslim victory over the Byzantines and that ended Christian rule over Syria and Palestine and the land of Israel. Muslims and Christians had a lot in common, but much divided them as well. Plus Muslims remained a minority population in the lands they ruled for half a millennium. For 500 years, something we don't think about, the Muslims were a minority rule over a majority culture that was made up mostly of Christians and Jews. There needed to be some way to define the relations between the conquering Muslims and those monotheist communities that lived under their rule. Here, a Muslim is playing chess with a Jew in 13th century Andalus. This is from uh, the Book of Games that was commissioned by Alphonse X of Castile. The Jews, like the Christians, are monotheists and needed to be factored into a very large monotheist world that was ruled by Muslims. This is a, a, apparently a, a prayer leader in a synagogue from a 14th century Spanish Haggadah. This is from the British Library. The Hebrew on the top says, Baal habayit uvnei veto sheomrim ha-hoda or hoda, the master of the house and his household who give thanks. You can see it very small here. Uh, on the top. Okay. So Jews and Christians were granted legal citizenship with rights under Muslim rule, but they were second class citizens. They were called vimis. Vimma means protection. The law of the Vimma protected the legal status of Jews and Christians, but it also restricted their rights. It established their legality through a kind of second class status that not only restricted their freedoms, but also it was designed to sometimes humiliate them. Jews and Christians, for example, were forbidden from riding horses. The status of vimmi applied to both Jews and Christians equally. And they were required to wear distinguishing uh, clothing that identified them as non-Muslims, so they couldn't pass. There were other restrictions as well. This secondary status is based on the authority of a pact that was established between the second caliph, Omar, and Christians who were conquered during the great Muslim conquest. The pact was established between the conquering Muslims and the conquered Christians, but it was extended also to the Jews who like the Christians were non-Muslims, but nevertheless monotheists. Their monotheist status accorded them certain rights, but much reduced from the rights of Muslims. You can see it. The top line here, if you're an Arabic reader, it is it says al uhda al umariya. It means the the pact or the covenant of Umar. Now, why Umar and who was he? Well, Umar was one of the closest companions of Muhammad. He was also the second caliph. The caliph is a a, a person who takes the place of someone else. Um, so it's like uh, the Hebrew word tahlif or mahlif comes from the same basic root. And the caliph is the person who takes the place of the leader of the Muslim community after the death of the prophet Muhammad. So Omar became a follower of Muhammad very early. So he had a lot of status. He was also the great conqueror. It was under his watch that Jerusalem was conquered. And some sources say that he led the armies that conquered Jerusalem. That's almost certainly not true, but it's not so important. His status as the conqueror is extremely high. Notice here, these are the four, they call the Rashidun, the four, the first four righteous caliphs, Abu Bakr, the closest friend of Muhammad, Omar, the second caliph, Uthman, the third caliph, 
and Ali, the fourth caliph. And these are their names in Arabic. And in the middle is Allah, God, and Muhammad, the prophet. People often refer to the Pact of Umar, but almost nobody actually reads it. It's available in many versions uh, in the early Muslim uh, community of historians. And this one, which we're going to take a look at in a moment, is by a 13th century Syrian scholar from Damascus named Ali ibn Asakir. So let's take a look at this Pact of Umar. This is from his work, this is uh, Ibn Asakir's Ta'arikh Medina al Dimashq, Medina Dimashq. It's um, uh, the history of the city of, of Damascus. So I'm just going to read it to you. You can read along with me if you'd like. We wrote to Umar ibn al Khattab, that's the full name of the Caliph Umar, when he accorded a peace to the Christians of Syria. And this is what we wrote In the name of God, the merciful and compassionate. This is a letter to the servant of God, Omar, commander of the faithful from the Christians of such and such a city. When you marched against us, we asked you for safe conduct for ourselves, our descendants, our property, and the people of our community. And we obligated ourselves that we will not build in our cities or in their vicinity, new monasteries or churches or convents or monks' cells, nor will we repair or rebuild what has been ruined of them. And now here's a whole list of things that the Christian community took upon itself to restrict itself as a uh, condition of being protected by the Muslim conquerors. We will not prevent any Muslim from lodging in our churches with food for three days. We will not give shelter in our dwellings or churches to any spy. We will not hide criminals from Muslims. We will not teach our children the Quran. We will not manifest our religion or proselytize. We will not prevent any of our kin from entering Islam if they wish. We will show respect toward Muslims and will rise from our seats when they wish, wish to sit. We will not seek to resemble the Muslims by imitating any of their garments. We will not speak as they do. This is all to try to you know, make sure you don't pass. We will not adopt their names. We will not ride on saddles, only bareback. We will not gird swords or bear any kind of arms. We will not engrave Arabic inscriptions on our seals. We will not sell fermented drinks. We will clip the fronts of our heads, or we will keep our gates wide open for passerbys. Okay, and there are a, a whole series here. I'm just going to read the ones that are highlighted here in the yellow. We will dress in the same way wherever we may be, and we will bind our zunar, special waist belt around our waist to identify ourselves. We're on down to number 23. We will not raise our voices in calling for church in the presence of any Muslims. We will not bring out our palm branches on Easter. We will not raise our voices for our dead. We will not take slaves who have been allotted to Muslims. And we will not build houses higher than Muslims. When I brought the letter to Umar, he added, and we will also not strike the Muslim. And then the, the end here, we accept, these are Christians who wrote this document. We accept these conditions for ourselves and for the people of our community. And in return, we receive security. If we in any way violate any of these items to which we obligated ourselves, we forfeit our protection and we become liable to you as people of opposition and accord. That's the end of the document. So this is considered by scholarly historians to be a forgery. It doesn't really make sense. Why would Christians ever voluntarily write such a letter? It was probably written back into history to authorize a voluntary acceptance of second class status by Christians and by extension also Jews, because these rules were also applied to Jews. So the question is, why impose upon yourself second-class status and permanent disability in society? Why beat yourself over the head, especially when the Roman Byzantine Empire, that is the Christian Empire, was by no means a non-entity at the time of Umar. It was a very powerful and militant empire. 
It seems clear that the document was not created under the rule of Umar ibn al-Khattab, but was written later, written by Muslims. And this is a kind of a, uh, a, a, an attempt to, um, to, to, to say that Christians agreed that they would take on the secondary status. In any event, Christians and Jews were stuck with the official nature of the document, which became something of a constitution regarding relations with non-Muslim monotheists in the Muslim world. It was not always enforced, but it was always on the books and it always could be enforced. So as Gene Wilder says here, what are you gonna do about it? Well, maybe there is not much one can do about it, but one option is to try to do an end run, kind of get around it. So how could one do this? Well, let's take a look. Umar was certainly the great conqueror. There's no question about that. But Muhammad was the prophet of God and who's greater? So if Muhammad had already made an agreement with the Jews, guaranteeing them privileges, then the pact of Umar applied only to the Christians. And it was with them who he was supposed to have made the pact in the first place. After all, the Muslim empire remained at war with the Christian Byzantine empire. There was no Jewish empire to have fought the Muslims. So you see here, there's Umar, the pact of Umar. But what if Muhammad, this is Muhammad here and highlighted in yellow. What if Muhammad had already made a pact with the Jews that said, yeah, well, I'm giving you, you know, great privileges because you're a great people or for whatever reason before the Pact of Umar. And the Umar Pact was applicable then only to Christians. Well, here's some more uh, suggestive evidence here. This is the Shahada. This is the statement of Muslim faith. There is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So Muhammad was the prophet from 570, died in 632. The first caliph, the first person to take over the community was his friend Abu Bakr. He lived for two years and then he died. And then Umar was the next caliph. And then Uthman, here's the uh, history right here. And then Ali. So Muhammad predated Umar. And the meaning of caliph, you know, is substitute. But Muhammad is the prophet of God, the ultimate authority for Muslim law and practice after the Quran. The end run was to argue that Muhammad had already made a pact guaranteeing the rights and privileges of the Jews before Umar became caliph. But why would Muhammad do that? Because according to the claim, and it's actually written in the pact itself, and we'll see it. The Jews rescued Muhammad when he was about to be destroyed by his enemies. And he was so grateful, he guaranteed them special status. Was it real? Well, probably not. This is probably another forgery. But we have what might be a reference to it in a ninth century work by a Persian historian named Ahmad Ibn Yahya al-Baladuri in his book called Futuh al buldan It's this book right here, the book of conquest of countries or book of conquest of nations. And here's the citation. A man from Egypt, Masr, has informed me that he saw there that the Jews letter with his own eye on red leather with the writing worn. He copied it and dictated his copy to me. So let's take a look now at this document. This is not the one that's, that's referenced in Al-Baladuri. This is a, a later uh, Yemenite version of the story, uh, partly because it uh, has some great graphics here. It's easy to, to see the Judeo-Arabic. If you look at the top half, if you are Hebrew readers, you'll see this is not Hebrew. This says, Innaka Nabi Fadil or Fadila Tu'mar Bil Araf Wutanha Al Mankur. It means you are the great prophet who commands the good and forbids the despicable. We are with you and we are for you. 
So this is a somewhat garbled paraphrase from the Quran, actually, and it's in Arabic, but it's written in Hebrew letters, which is the usual way for Jews to write in the pre-modern Muslim world. So how could they get away with writing an official Arabic document signed by Muhammad, but written in Hebrew letters? Well, that's a bit of a mystery, but the important issue is the content, not the way in which it was recorded. Remember, everything is oral. Original documents are no longer available. Everything is a copy that was written by a scribe. So whether the copy was written in Arabic script or in Hebrew script, in some ways doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a reproduction, it's a, a record of something that was supposed to have occurred in the early period. And in most Arab uh, areas in the Middle Ages, um, the Muslims couldn't read or write in any case, except for the leaders, right? And the scholars. So now let's see exactly what's actually in this document. Okay, so here we go. Uh, had a, a dhimma. This says, this is the dhimma. You can see it up here in the upper right. Had a, a dhimma. A ladhi, dhammam, a nabi, Muhammad, ala, uh, ala, where are we? Ala bani Israel. And it's spelled interesting because it's not a sheen there, a sin, it's a, it's a samir. This is the protection of the prophet Muhammad established for the children of Israel. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate, in whom we seek help against an oppressive people. When it was 1300 years after the rule of Alexander the Great, the unbelievers rebelled against the city of the prophet Muhammad and caused a terrible riot. God helped him against them, killed their greatest men and destroyed their dwellings. After that, the tribes of the children of Israel came to Muhammad and they said, don't worry, O prophet of God, we have learned, we're at the end of the page, so we're gonna to move to the next page. We have learned that you are a distinguished prophet commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Uh, this is a paraphrase of Quran 3, 110. We are with you and we are for you. We will fight with you, those who rebel against you. So Muhammad fetched them and caused great turmoil with the Jews until he plundered the city of the enemy, destroyed it and took captive their women and children and took captive Safiya bin al-Hawi bint al-Akhtab, ibn al-Abi uh, Talib, uh, who flung open the gates of the city about 107 cubits. The children of Israel understood that the victory of God and the victory of Muhammad and Ali had come to them. So they brought their elders and their religious scholars before Muhammad and they said, O prophet of God, okay, listen, this is very important. We will follow you and we will fight with you a fierce jihad and the term jihad is used. And so the children of Israel fought with Muhammad until midday on Friday, and Prophet Muhammad forbade killing at that time on behalf of the children of Israel. And he said to the Israelites, to the Jews, go and observe your Sabbath as God commanded you through Moses, Ibn Imran, upon him peace. The children of Israel gathered together and they left. That means they left the fighting so that they could observe the Sabbath. But then the chiefs and enemies gathered and attacked the Prophet Muhammad and routed him and his people. So apparently what happened, according to the story, is that when the Jews left, Muhammad lost a very powerful force in his fighting group. And then he was being overwhelmed by the enemy because the Jews weren't there to help him. After that, the tribes of the children of Israel approached him and said, don't worry, O prophet of God. And he said, no, don't worry yourselves, O children of Israel. Go and observe your Sabbath as God commanded you through Moses bin Imran on Mount Sinai. With God's help, we will be victorious against them. The children of Israel replied and they said, there's little Sabbath remaining. So with the setting of the sun on Sabbath night, the children of Israel went out and raided the towns of the rebellious unbelievers and killed 400,000 horsemen and 500 infantry. Unlikely that that's an accurate uh, accounting. Okay. so. 
These are photos of Arabian Jews. Note that they're proud, lean and mean, and armed. These are authentic photos, Jews in Arabia in the 20th century. All right. Now back to the story. When the Prophet Muhammad learned about this, that the Jews had come back and had defeated his enemies, he relaxed and laughed and he said, you wage jihad along with me, O children of Israel. So by God's truth, I will reward you well, God willing, inshallah, with my protection, my covenant, my fullest effort, my writing, and my witnessing for as long as my community remains on earth. Then the companions, the scribes, the Ansar, these are the people that, uh, the helpers of Muhammad, the elders and the commanders stood by along with Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a great Jewish rabbinic convert to Islam, according to Islamic tradition, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin, and said, listen, O community of Israel and Muslims and believers, God has revealed to me that I will offer protection to the tribes of Israel and write for them my protection, my covenant, and my pledge. This is something that no one will transgress against them through abuse, violence, enmity, or oppression from what I will instruct you. Oh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali was the scribe, so he wrote it all down according to the tradition. And according to Islamic tradition, he was Muhammad's, a, a major scribe for Muhammad. He wrote a lot of important documents. So this fits into that pattern. So back to the story. He, that is uh, Ali, the Muslims and elders and commanders answered and said, O prophet of God, the knowledge is your knowledge and the prophecy is your prophecy, which is like saying, absolutely, you're right. Then Ali ibn Abi Talib came forward and the prophet Muhammad said, Iktab, write in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, peace to you all. And after that, he wrote, praise to God, Lord of the worlds, who chose me and gave me prophecy for you, O community of Israel and Muslims and believers all together. Right? This is a kind of formulaic as these documents were, partly to prove that it's a true document, right? It has to follow certain expected rules. Now we'll go on. This is a bit of a document, but it's, a, it's interesting to see the details. Muhammad is continuing. He's dictating now to Ali. Know that God sent me as guidance, compassion, and light to the world. Know, O oh you present, that the children of Israel are re will return to their strongholds to live in them. They are safe under the security of God and the security of the Muslims, the community of Muhammad. So when you read this writing of mine and my protection and this sign of mine, then you shall act according to this revelation and the words that I brought that the children of Israel are under my protection that I brought for them. And I have removed from them every offense, every abuse, every criminal accusation. You shall protect them in every town and island and city of the Muslims. And they have no offense, no claim against their legal rights, and no conscription to a military unit, and no jihad. They shall not be wronged or tithed from their property, or from what their land brings forth in the way of grapes and seed and plantings, palm groves and the like. They shall not be forbidden from entering mosques or homes. Whoever is in need among them shall receive support from the Muslim community. And whoever does good for them shall see good, and whoever does evil to them shall see evil. And whoever harms a Jew, even by an infinitesimal amount, this is a, 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 an idiom that's found in the Quran, God will not bless what he has earned in wealth and vineyard and seed planting. And I will not be an advocate on the day of resurrection. This is important because if you're a good Muslim, uh, Muhammad on the day of resurrection will advocate for you to ensure that you go to heaven and the day of judgment and punishment for they, a reference to the Jews, have the book of God and the unity of God and wisdom and refinement. It's an amazing, amazing document, right? So here are more Jews from Southern Arabia, Yemen. They're all from what is today called Yemen, but they're from different tribes that speak different dialects and hold customs that are sometimes quite different from one another. Interesting community of people. Really, really lovely uh, photos here. 
Okay, and well, back to the story. I require, Muhammad continues speaking, I require for them esteem and honor, protection and safeguarding on every route, in every city, in every island. This is just so contrary to the Pact of Umar. I am responsible for this in the honor of the elders and the Ansar and the honor of Safiya bin al Hawi bin al Khattab. We'll get back to that if you're interested. Whoever does not honor this protection of mine for them, my covenant and my witness, I am free from him and he is not from me and I am not from him, meaning I am not going to support him. He is not of my community. Whoever rules over them, and now we, in some of these documents, in some of the versions, it, it gives the, the certain restrictions on who can actually rule over the Jews from the Muslim community. Whoever rules over them may exact a claim from them. They shall tie the zunar on their turbans, so it shall be known that they are Jews from the protection, dhimma, so that no one shall injure them or wrong them, shall not make them leave their religion to another religion, nor prohibit reading of the Torah that came down to them through prophet Moses. His name in Arabic is the uh, his moniker, Kalim Allah, the, the, the statement or the saying of God upon him peace. They may not suffer injustice, nor their Sabbath be desecrated or be abused on their Sabbath by working. More cool photos. Uh, and now back to the text and we're almost done. They may not be prevented from praying in their study houses or from their festivals and fasts or anything else. Whoever defies my protection, I will not be his advocate on the day of judgment, the day of resurrection and reckoning. Whoever is in need among them and asks for support, support him. Whoever does good for them will see good. Whoever does evil to them will see evil. We see this repeated here. And whoever misappropriates their property wrongly does the same for Fatima bint Muhammad. And that was the daughter of Muhammad. Such a person has no helpful intercessor in this world or intercession in the afterlife. His place is hell. Amen. And this protection results from their having waged jihad with me and having desecrated their Sabbath for me, fighting on the Sabbath day, a kindness to me. We pressed and were victorious over the enemy. We destroyed them and killed them. 700,000 of their horsemen were gone, 500 infantrymen, all this was with the help and assistance of God and the men of the children of Israel. So by God, O community of Muslims, in completing this, my written protection, you bear witness for me on the 13th year of the Hijra, on the 20th day of the month of noble Ramadan, regarding the matter in its entirety, peace and the mercy of God on the children of Israel and the Muslims. Amin. We're almost done. Witnesses, they have to have witnesses to sign the document. Witnesses include, and then there are names of various people. And then the last paragraph, the prophet, well, the prophet Muhammad upon him prayers sealed it with his seal. And this is the actual pedigree of Muhammad. And this gives an interesting pedigree that goes back to Adam. And you'll see, this is a kind of truncated one, but sometimes they're much longer. This one, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, that's our Muhammad. And then he goes back to Ishmael ibn Ibrahim, son of Tarikh, son of Nahor. And then goes back to Abuna, our father, Adam of the dust, made from the dust, upon him prayers and on all the prophets. And then this is... Uh, uh, appended to this as a description of the prophet Muhammad to prove that he actually was there. He was not tall, nor was he short. Whoever defies this covenant has no advocate on the day of resurrection. More repetition. Whoever defies this covenant, he makes his own way to hell in which are seven departments, each lasting 800 years. Whoever upholds my protection will end up in heaven for 700 years, the 700 levels, each level lasting 800 years among the righteous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Last paragraph. So ends the document of protection of the prophet upon him prayers. The copyist is Salam ibn Musa, ibn ibn al-Hasan, ibn al-Mu, Musa, known as Madmun, upon him peace, 
And this is noted in the event that someone come and say that it is his. Followed by an interesting set of letters at the end of the document. What do you think this signifies? Shin Yud Aleph 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 Bet. Here it is. Here is the decoder. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kuvod Machut Olam Bet. The Jewish scribe had to put that in there, <laughs> even though it's supposed to be a Muslim document dictated by the Prophet Muhammad. Of course. It's a forgery. All right. So the question now is, um, did it work? Well, the answer is sort of. It kind of worked. A well-known Yemenite Israeli named Nisim Gamlieli who was uh, one of the people who, uh, who uh, produced one of these copies from his own tichlal that he had from his father. He recalled from his childhood in Yemen, I think he wrote this in the 30s, how his father would use it. And I'm going to quote him. I remember as a child, every sage and every important Muslim influential person who came to our home my father would not allow him to leave until after he read to him a testament of protection, wasiyat al My father would read it from a written text from beginning to end with great enthusiasm as one who was trying to rebuke. So the responsible listeners would treat the Jews, the people of protection, according to what was written in it. I remember also that these distinguished Gentiles would hear the document with open mouth and bowed head, standing before my father like chastised children, ashamed of their lack of knowledge of history. This is truly amazing. So we see that there are cases in which it seems to have worked, protected Jews. Um, Goytine, this famous Jewish scholar of Yemenite Jewry uh, visited Yemen in the 1930s. And he tells a story about uh, a man that he met, a, a Yemeni Jew who was incarcerated. He was, he was taken by the authorities really to, to extort money from him, on, uh, uh, to put in jail and accused of a crime. So he would have to pay a bakshish to get out of jail. He'd have to pay a bribe to get out of jail. And according to what this man told Goytine, the guy said it was on a Friday afternoon that he was arrested. And he said, uh, he said the protection for the Sabbath and the uh, authorities that arrested him made him go home because he was obligated by the uh, wasia, that is this covenant to uh, not be incarcerated on the Sabbath day. So he went home for the Sabbath and then he had to go back to jail in the day after and then pay his bribe. But at least he could come home for the Sabbath. There are also some other cases that are really fascinating. So um, did it work in other cases? Mm, not so much. Here's a, a case recording recorded uh, from a, a Muslim historian and I'm going to read it from you. Uh, in the 10th century, a group of Jews, these are Jewish children also from Arabia, a group of Jews from Haibar showed the great Abbasid vizier Abu Hassan ibn al-Furat a document that claimed that Muhammad freed them from the poll tax, the jizya. The vizier looked through it and announced immediately that it was a forgery. When the Jews asked him, how did he know that? <laughs> he explained that the date on the document was off by 67 days, occurring after the battle that the document was referring to. But still, the, um, the, the vizier was a nice guy. And in his graciousness, he released the Jews from the tax anyway. I think he probably thought to himself, nice try. It was a, it was a great try, good effort. And um, he, this is what he quotes here. To honor the man in whose name the document was written. That is Muhammad. So it looks like it worked in some cases. It didn't work in other cases. And it's a very, very interesting document.
the end. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we can have uh, some Q&A and, and open discussion. So let me do that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Firestone. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question, and this might be uh, a somewhat ignorant question, but from what I understand, the Muslim tradition does not recognize um, the like theological underpinnings of Judaism. So they don't recognize the Sabbath as something that's legitimate because it's not in the Quran. So isn't there like a lack of internal consistency? Like why would Muhammad even honor the Sabbath if it was not considered a legitimate observance? Yeah, um, well, first of all, it's not so simple. <laughs> These things are usually much more complicated than one thinks. So yeah, um, the Sabbath observant is not obligatory upon Muslims and their observance of Friday does not include what we call Shavuot for the Sabbath where you are obligated by Jewish law to, to cease engaging in the worldly activities that we engage in during the week. Their obligation is to go to the Friday prayer and it's the communal prayer in which you need a minion on a Friday but you don't really need it for any other time. And, and, and that's what it's all about. Yes, having said that, <clears throat> there's a very interesting and very important story in the Quran in which the Jews are punished in the Quran because they did not observe the Sabbath according to the way they were supposed to observe the Sabbath. And it was God's uh, uh, will that they observe the Sabbath and that they not refrain from observing the Sabbath according to that tradition. That applies to Jews, but not to Muslims. So there is a kind of sense of integrity associated with the Sabbath. It doesn't apply to Muslims. Now, the Muslim interpretive tradition on this episode is quite varied, and there are all kinds of different opinions about that. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the question is probably coming from uh, the perspective that why wouldn't Muslims know that Jews were writing this fake document? And um, I don't know, apparently it did pass in some cases. Uh, one could say, and I think it's a, a legitimate uh, observation that if, uh, if this were to actually happen, I don't believe it happened. I don't believe the story occurred that is written about. I don't believe the Jews desecrated the Sabbath to fight for uh, a man that was in competition with them and was actually, uh, in, in, essentially kind of an enemy, the Jews and, and the early Muslim community, I don't think they would do that. But uh, one could say uh, that uh, if the Jews were willing to do that, then they certainly deserve, even if Muslims didn't uh, observe the Sabbath, they certainly uh, deserve to have the kind of protection and special privileges that were granted to them. Okay. Um, here I've got a question from Ursula and David. They want to know about the Battle of Khabar and uh, that is echoed in contemporary anti-Jewish statements. Yeah, the Battle of Khaybar. Um, Battle of Khaybar, uh, actually, I mean, there are all kinds of rumors and, and uh, tradesh, uh, legends that are associated with the Battle of Khaybar. Uh, the, the Khaybaris were J Jews, or most of them were Jews. And Haibar is, an, is a, a, a town, an oasis town. It's not far away from Medina and Mecca. It's in that area in the Hejaz of uh, Arabia. And the, um, the Haibaris were, that were engaged in a, in a battle with Muhammad were made up of two communities of people, the local Jewish tribes that were living in Haibar and one of the tribes uh, that was exiled from uh, uh, Medina by Muhammad, who opposed the prophet. And they were uh, particularly uh, uh, antagonistic between uh, the Jews in, from that tribe and Muhammad and his followers. And there was a battle in Haibar. In, in fact, apparently there wasn't all that much fighting. There were skirmishes. There, it was carried out over a long period of time. There were individual duels between various people and people were trying to um, make kind of bravado, uh, but um, the, and the Muslims beat them, or the, the followers of the prophet beat them, the, the local Haibaris, 
and they took over the oasis and they allowed the Haibari Jews to live there. And the Jews lived there instead of paying, um, uh, they, were, they were required to pay a, a pretty significant tax to the conquerors, but they were not exiled from that area until some years later by a caliph, but not by Muhammad himself. The, the tradition of the Chaibari, the, that statement about Chaibar, Chaibar al-Yahud or something like that. Um, I actually, frankly, I don't really know that. Uh, I don't know where that rumor comes from. I, I don't see that in the sources that I've been reading about the battle at Chaibar. So I can't help you with that. Uh, we have two questions about the document itself. Um, so one, somebody wants to know if there are any copies in Arabic. And the other question I think is more in relation to that uh, first image that somebody wanted to confirm that that was found in the Geniza, the Cairo, uh, the Cairo Geniza. Right, the first image is not found in the Geniza. I didn't include that uh, image. I have that image too. It's just not as pretty. It, it looks cooler, this one. And I actually looked at this version of the document rather than the uh, Geniza version of the document. There's only one Geniza version. All the others are from Yemenite Tikhlaus. Um, so, yeah. And, and are there copies of this document in Arabic? No, we, we have not found any that are written in Arabic script. They're all in Arabic, right? Because they're all written in Arabic language, right. but they are written in Hebrew letters. Yeah. So it's basically a document only found within Jewish communities. There's no Arabic, uh, I don't know, leaders that are kind of retaining some. Uh, That's right. Aside evidence. from, aside from occasional references like the two that I mentioned to you, right? One by uh, Baladuri, and another one that was uh, um, a later document. Right. Okay. So it's it's possible. I mean, I, I think these documents existed, and they existed in the early period, but they weren't authentically written or dictated by the prophet to Ali. That's, that's my argument. I mean, it's, and I'm not the originator of that argument. I'm just following the general thrust of uh, academics who work on this topic. There's an, there's an interesting, let me just take a moment to add another piece to this. There's a parallel phenomenon among Christians. There are Christian documents of treaties between Muhammad and Christians that guarantee the rights of Christians that also attempt to make an end run around the Pact of Umar. And one of them, uh, one of the most important ones is found in the Santa Catarina Monastery that was preserved from a very early period by monks in Sinai. And right now there is one, uh, there are a couple of Christian um, writers and a couple of Muslim writers who claim that those are actually authentic, that they were actually written, they reflect a true uh, a true document that was written by the prophet Muhammad for the Christian community. And it's, um, uh, uh, mm, they're not really academic historians who are making that claim. These are Christian um, thinkers and activists who want to have good relations with the Muslim world, which I completely understand, but they probably are not, there's just not enough evidence that, that these things are, are accurate or that the Jewish ones are, are, are authentic either. That is, what I mean by that is they're authentic documents, ancient documents, but they weren't dictated by Muhammad and uh, written down by Ali, but were rather forged by Christian and Jewish uh, individuals who were trying to get a better deal. Somewhat successfully. Uh, we have yeah. one more question here if we have time. Uh, were these Jima considerations helpful to any Jews except those in Yemen? Oh, um, we don't know. Not, not, not that we know of. Um, we, we don't have a lot of information. And I don't think there's more information from the Geniza. That would be the location. But I'm not an expert on all that's in the Geniza, which is a huge amount of material. And there are still people doing a lot of work on the Geniza. So I, I really don't know uh, of anything well, outside of Yemen. I think the question was more whether this kind of document was helpful to Jews in, let's say, you know, living in Israel, Palestine, or any other regions other than Yemen? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. This is a really interesting and unique topic. And Yoram, I'll let you close things off. Thank you, uh, Ruben. So I have a question. 
there is any Hajat al Islam or Mullah that uh, in the last, I don't know, couple of hundred of years that mentioned this document? Uh, not that I know of. No. Okay, so thank you for your interesting and really beautiful lectures. I, I learned a lot, so thank you very much. And I'm sure yeah. that the other people really learned a lot. You're very welcome. And we want to hear more, so <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Take care. It's good to be here, and it's good to be a part of this uh, community, and it's really great to support the Cloud Library, which is doing so many fantastic things for us. I'm so happy to be here. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very Bye. much.